I remember the panic attacks, the debilitating anxiety, the sense that everything I loved was crumbling. For months, I coped in any way I could, moving from medications to unhealthy drinking. This kind of emotional crisis, the sense that something inside of us is wrong, this is rapidly becoming the norm. Now I wonder, is it possible that we're all living with systems of habits that are perfectly designed to produce this kind of life? The modern world is a habit formation machine. We wake up and we scroll social media. From waiting in line at the grocery store to stopping at a red light, we fill every idle moment with technology. We spend our day distracted by notifications. We rarely sit down to talk face to face. We rarely take time to rest. The problem with all these habits is not that any one of them is so bad, it's that they're all unconscious. This technological life, the one that was supposed to set us free, actually enslaves us to meaningless lives of distraction. What if instead we designed habits that pushed us towards a life of meaning and love? Isn't that what we're meant for? Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Hey Tom. Hey Mark. What would you say, Tom, is one of the most important habits for you? Well, sitting here in the Kids Creek room at our Potterville campus makes me think about the time that I get up before my boys get up in the morning. If I get up at 6 o'clock, for them getting up at 6.45, then I have plenty of time to go to the bathroom and do everything I need to in there and stretch my feet and pray and go out and make myself some breakfast and put dishes away and then gently and leisurely get them up at 6.45 and then we eat breakfast together and we sing and we pray and I help them make their lunches and I make a lunch and then I've got time to get them out to the bus stop and time to exercise and shower all before showing up here to, to film a message with, with you. me. Yeah, so, yeah. so six o'clock is six o'clock. the sweet spot. Yep, six o'clock. But if I get up like I do sometimes at 6.40, five minutes before I have to wake them up, I am running into the bathroom, doing my business there. I don't get to stretch. I don't get to pray. I'm rushing them through breakfast. Instead of having time to exercise, I'm showering when I would be exercising. And then I'm rushing here to try to do this with you. It's crazy. 40 minutes makes totally a huge different. difference. Yeah. That's like a keystone habit. You, you when know, you get up. yeah, when you get up. Mm -hmm. Or actually, maybe the keystone habit is really when did I go to bed at night? <laughs> That's true. That probably has a big impact on what. <laughs> or maybe you... even more so whether I turn my computer off and stop watching videos uh, late at night. Whatever the case is, the keystone habit is like a keystone, actual stone in an arch. You're familiar with the arch and the Damn. keystone is the one at the top and holds the whole arch together. If that thing is together, then the rest of the arch is solid. If that keystone is not there, then the arch just collapses. So when you get up, it has a huge impact huge on impact. your day. It's a keystone habit. Absolutely. Well, today, Tom, we're starting a series on habits. Yeah talking about habits throughout this series, particularly keystone habits, these, these key habits that are going to have a big impact on the rest of our life, uh, the rest of our day, all those sorts of things. And this series is based on a book called The Common Rule, which was written by Justin Whitmel. Great early. book. It's a fantastic book. In our micro bookstore. It is. We highly recommend that you get a copy of it and read it. And Justin, after spending four years as a missionary in China, decided to come back to the United States. He got a law degree and he became a practicing lawyer. And as he began to practice law, he suffered an emotional breakdown. I can't imagine why. He just completely fell apart. And so he had anxiety. He had panic attacks. Uh, he was absolutely a mess. And in, in thinking about that, he realized while the house of my life was decorated with Christian content, the architecture of my habits was just like everyone else's. My body had finally become converted to the anxiety and busyness I'd worshipped through my habits and routines. That just really rings true for me, Justin's experience. And he goes on to say this, We're all living according to a specific regimen of habits, and those habits shape most of our life. 
It's true. Our, our habits shape our lives. They're really powerful things. And it's even more than that. Our habits also shape our hearts. Wow. Uh, our, our habits are just incredibly powerful things. As Charles Duckig states, when a habit is formed, the brain stops fully participating in decision making. The patterns we have unfold automatically. And I love how he notes that the brain stops, stops. functioning with a habit. Like, we just move forward. That's crazy. It is. It's like being on autopilot. Yeah, it's absolutely. I think about when I was in sixth grade and I went to bed and then I woke up and I started to go through my routine again in the morning and I got showered and I went down and got breakfast and after I had eaten, I went to take my dishes to the dishwasher and I happened to glance at the microwave clock and noticed that it was 2 a.m. Oh. And oh no. I, I thought, why is the microwave clock not working? So I went around to a different clocks in the house. It turns out that I had woken up in the wee hours of the morning and I had plenty of time that morning. Plenty of time to get for everything I wanted to do. I had just got on autopilot and started doing my morning routine. It was crazy. That happens. Have you had something like that happen? Oh yeah, many different times. Uh, I think of one example several years ago, my family and I, we moved to a new house and this is back when I was working at Michigan State. And so uh, one day at the end of work, I got in my car and I, I went to drive home and I was driving home and all of a sudden I realized I was driving to the wrong house. So I was <laughs> driving to the old house, I got on autopilot, I had to yeah. turn around and go to the, the house I actually owned and where my family was living. That brings us to a question for discussion. What's one of your keystone habits? And what habits, good or bad, have you had on autopilot? Let's discuss that. time when I think about being on autopilot in these certain habits that we have I think but one of the reasons we don't fully examine our habits is because we wrestle with habits and this idea of freedom yeah we think to limit myself to limit myself with certain habits is to restrict my freedom I love how Justin corrects us in that way of thinking he says this what if true freedom comes from choosing the right limitations not avoiding all limitations the right limitations, Mark, create freedom. They do. I, I think of this and I think of how much I love high ropes courses. And <laughs> You're already a tall guy. I'm already on. a tall guy, but I love getting up high. I'm scared of heights, and so it's a huge adrenaline rush for me. Uh, but part of the reason I'm able to do that is because you put on a harness mm -hmm. and a rope. And so with the right limitations, I can still remember when I was in high school, I went on a high ropes course, I climbed up to the top of a telephone pole like 30 feet plus up in the air. That's crazy, plus another six, and then whatever. And standing on top of the telephone pole, I could, it was swaying back and forth, and then I jumped and I grabbed a trapeze wow. bar. Wow. I would never have done any of that if I hadn't had the limitation of having a rope on and having that harness. Yeah, I, I could have done all that stuff, but probably not as good of an idea. Limiting freedom, constraining freedom, can actually give you more freedom at times to try things and to explore things. Without the limit of that rope, you would have been dead. Yes. No freedom left. Yes. This reminds me of Paul's letter to the Romans. Paul was the first missionary of the church. He wrote many of the books of the Bible. In the sixth chapter of his letter to the Romans, he says this. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Of course not. He's like, the rope has been cut, right, from those limitations. Now that we're limitless, should we just continue to do whatever our freedom wants us to do? No, is what he says. Well, he continues. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. In other words, Paul is saying that total freedom to do whatever you want, that's going to ultimately not lead to freedom, it's going to lead to death. But rather, there's a sort of freedom that comes in the limitations of obeying righteousness. He, he goes on and says, Thank God, once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. 
Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Now that's a kind of weird way to say it, uh, slaves to righteousness. But really what Paul is meaning in this is that following the rules or limitations of righteousness, of holiness, of love and justice, of not doing whatever it is that you think you want to do, that's where you actually find real freedom. Limitations brings freedom, Paul says. Yeah, we, we put on the harness and the rope to have true freedom. And, and when I think about this idea of surrender and freedom, I think of Jesus. And I think we could argue that no one surrendered more freedom than Jesus wow, yeah. when he became one of us. Uh, I, I love how Paul says, instead he gave up his divine privileges he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. That, that's Jesus. That's what Jesus has done. He gave up his freedom for us. Talking about this passage from Philippians, Justin says this, We, for our own sake, tried to become limitless, and the world was ruined. Jesus, for our sake, became limited, and the world was saved. saved. That's absolutely amazing. That is amazing. I love the way that Justin phrases that. So what we're going to introduce in this series and today is a kind of volunteer limitation called a rule of life. A rule of life is something that's a communal set of practices, a communal set of habits, keystone habits, a communal set of choosing some limitations that ultimately bring freedom, freedom to love God and to love others. Mark, speaking of habits of loving God, Let's go ahead and move to the Fellowship Hall where Teen Fuel meets, and let's, uh, let's stop there and let's pray. Sounds good. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. So Tom, whether we're aware of it or not, all of us have adopted a rule of life. Yes. Yeah. The American rule of life. Yep. And it's a rule of life that leads to anxiety, that leads to depression, that leads to injustice, uh, that leads to just overwhelming busyness. It leads to vanity. Mm -hmm. And Justin noted this. He noted this about the way that we live our lives as Americans. And he said, talking about Jesus while ignoring the way of Jesus, has created an American Christianity that is far more American than it is Christian. Ouch. Ouch. So in the midst of reflecting on this in his own life, he developed the common rule, which people can look this whole thing up on the website. There's some great resources there. You can download a PDF that we'll probably share out in many different ways throughout this series. Yeah, there are a lot of habits here in this rule of life to digest, and those resources are helpful for doing that. So he's going to present to us eight keystone habits. Eight habits, you do these, and it's going to have a major impact on the rest of your life. And there's a lot of different ways to think about these habits, but maybe the first one and the one that's going to guide our time through this series is thinking about them as daily habits. There's four daily habits and four weekly habits. So those four daily habits are kneeling prayer at morning, midday, and bedtime, one meal with others, one hour with the phone off, and scripture before you do anything with the phone in the morning. Then there's four weekly habits. One hour of conversation with a friend, curate your media consumption to four hours. That one's really hard. That is. Fast from something for 24 hours, another hard one, and take a day of Sabbath. So four weekly habits, four daily habits. That's one way of thinking about this, this common rule. Another way of thinking about it is there's four habits that help us to love God, and there's four habits that help us to love others. So mm -hmm. loving God is things like Sabbath and fasting and prayer and scripture before our phone. Loving others is things like meals and conversation and having our phone off for an hour and curing our media consumption to four hours. But maybe my favorite way of thinking about these eight habits is that there's four habits of embracing and four habits of resisting. The four habits of embracing are Sabbath, prayer, meals, and conversation. 
And the four habits of resisting are fasting, scripture before phone, the phone off, and curating your media. So today's habit that we are focusing on is a daily habit of kneeling prayer three times a day at morning and at noon and at bedtime. And that's why you and I have been kneeling in prayer oh, throughout yeah. this message. That is why we've been doing that. So we have a chat question for you for discussion. What prayer habits have you experimented with either in the past or in the present? Let's take a moment and discuss that. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So Tom, the words we use, the words are really important. Yeah. Uh, words show our love of God. Words show our love of our neighbor. But words can really be tied to how we embrace or resist certain things. Yeah. Several well-known prayer books that provide words for prayer. One of them is the prayer book called Common Prayer. Or another one that I use on a regular basis called Hour by Hour, which is a sort of shortening of a bigger book called the Book of Common Prayer. That's maybe one of the more popular ones. But in the same way that there's a Book of Common Prayer, there's also a sort of Book of Common Groans at different Ooh. times of the day. Starting in the morning, there's the groan of, I really should have woken up earlier. <laughs> what in the world are these kids doing up so early? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> How am I gonna get everything done that I have to get done today? I have seriously, I'm talking seriously, got to start working on that project today. And then there's the prayers that are electronic ones, the notifications on our phones that just start beeping at us the minute that we wake up. They do. So I think of that book of common groans and it continues at midday, the things that make us groan. I'm not gonna get it all done. Mm. I'm losing control of my day. Oh yeah. I don't know how I'll make it. Or I'm not worth anything if I don't get something done today. Mm. If I don't produce. Then there's the book of common groans at bedtime. I really should go to bed earlier tonight. I'll just watch one more episode. I shouldn't have watched one more episode. Those are the common groans. I can relate to that. And I think the danger in all this is it can sort of lead to a certain sort of legalism. Uh, that throughout our day, you know, we are our actions, yeah. and we are judged based on our actions. And what prayer does is it reorients us to God's love for us. It helps us remember that we are a beloved child of God, no matter how we spend our day. Yeah. And we need that reorientation mm -hmm. to make good choices throughout the day, to have good habits throughout the day. We're not gaining God's love through prayer we are responding to God's love in prayer. So today's challenge that we're focusing on is daily prayer kneeling three times a day, morning, noon, and bedtime. Do you really have to kneel, Tom? Uh, some of us don't have such an easy time getting down on the ground and kneeling. I love how Justin answers this question. He says, often one of the only ways to take hold of the mind is to take hold of the body. If kneeling doesn't work for you, find what does work for you. I mean, it could just be putting your hands up in your lap. It could be laying flat on your back. It could be laying prostrate on the ground. You could get some yoga poses in there. I mean, child's pose or go crazy with the plow. I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> As I said, I have a hard time kneeling. And, and there are other ways you can be physical when you pray. Like one of the things I think of is walking and yeah. praying, which is something that I do. And there's a way that walking can help keep you focused on praying. Or another way is to write out your prayers. Writing helps keep your mind from wandering. So today's challenge is a daily habit of kneeling prayer three times a day, morning, noon, and evening. And we're just gonna walk through each one of those, starting with the morning. I love how C.S. Lewis, the author of Mere Christianity, talks about the challenge of the morning. He says this, It comes the very moment you wake up each morning. All your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists simply in shoving them all back, in listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in. 
and so on all day, standing back from all your natural fussings and frettings, coming in out of the wind. You know, I think one way that you can do this in the morning is to make your prayers communal. If you are married or if you have a significant other or if you have kids, these are times that you can pray in the morning with those people. Make this a family thing. I pray each morning at the breakfast table with my boys. We sing a hymn. We read some scripture. We, we, we pray for their day while we're eating breakfast. Or you could do this with a small group. Or if you want to, you could use technology to help you. I mean, one of the things I use is a prayer app called Pray As You Go. And it's the first thing that I do with my phone in the morning. Yeah, it's an important reminder, Tom, that this prayer that we're talking about, it can be as an individual, but it's really powerful when it's together with other people in yeah. community, which is what the common rule is really all about, doing these things together. We, we've covered our kneeling prayer in the morning. The next is kneeling prayer at noon. And the importance of kneeling prayer at noon really ties into work. You know, work is where we make something of the world, but there's tension in our work. Work is good, and it's hard. Around the middle of the day is when our plans start to fall apart. You realize that what you thought you could do, you're not gonna get done. It's a moment to reorient yourself to the work of God's love and grace in your life and the lives of those around you. To remember that your fellow employees or colleagues, they're human beings before they are human doings. It's an opportunity to reorient yourself to the mission of Jesus in this world and how you're fitting into that. And it can also be a moment to reorient yourself to where do you need to do some repair work? Maybe you have done something or said something to somebody and you need to go back and say, hey, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I'm gonna do better next time. Yeah, and if you're, if you're busy at work though, this can be hard to remember to do mm -hmm. as your day goes on. Here's another place where you can use technology to the benefit of your prayer life. I, when we started to try to do this, decided to just ask Siri to remind me every day at noon to stop what I'm doing and kneel in prayer. So every day a notification comes up, reminds me to kneel at noon for prayer. I think there are also, you know, less technological solutions that we can use to remind us. There, there are sort of daily triggers that we have that can move us toward prayer. So for example, we get in our car and before we start the car, we can pause and pray. Or we drive to work and before we exit the car and head into work, we pause and pray. And, and you know, I think around midday, often we stop and eat. Uh, there's a great trigger there, a reminder to stop and pray. And again, kneeling might not be possible for you because of your space or physical limitations. It, it might be weird in the middle of a meeting at work to, to get down on your knees. Or if you work pray. at a department store. <laughs> exactly. Lots of different situations. And the idea here is to somehow be physical with your body. And so, you know, maybe again, it's sitting with your palms up. Uh, maybe it's getting up for a brief walk. And it, this doesn't need to be a long thing, but just getting up and praying briefly. Or it could be just going to a window and looking out the window and praying as you look out the window. So today's challenge is daily kneeling prayer three times a day, morning and noon. We've talked about it. Now let's talk about bedtime. bedtime. The question at the end of the day is, how am I going to end this thing? It is, you know, am I going to go to bed and, and I'm going to lie there and replay over and over again, lying awake the day that I just went through? It, thinking about how bad you did it, judging yourself or judging others and getting frustrated with them. Nursing grudges. Or anxiously ruminating on the things that we didn't get done that now spill into the next day. Or just browsing our phone for the latest news, the latest celebrity tidbit, the TikToker, the influencer, the YouTube page, the social media, whatever it is, like are, are these images we're gonna fill with our mind as we go to bed? Or we can resist all of that and embrace God, and we can walk intentionally toward the rest that we need at night. I think at this point, some people might be feeling a little overwhelmed. This all feels maybe a little overwhelming. I mean, we're talking about the first habit right now, right? And we have seven more to go. Seven more to go. And one thing that we wanna remind people about is that what is overwhelming is a default, normal, unexamined American life. Over this series, what we're trying to do is do fewer things and more meaningful things. To, to take on these eight keystone habits that 
change the way that we live the rest of our life. So we are in the common rule challenge and there are some next step challenge Challenges, options that yep. we want to encourage people to engage with. Uh, the first option would be to try one habit for one week. Hmm. It's a great place Simple to start. Place, yeah. A second option would be to try one different habit each day of the week. It's a great so one. So start there. A third way to engage this would be to try one or two habits for a season. So for a week or for a month or mm -hmm. for Lent, which we just entered into this past yeah. week. Or go finally, all in. All in. Try all eight habits. See if you can do all of these. Through, through Lent would be a great season. It would be a that. great way to do yeah. it. Here's our last question for discussion. What part of the challenge will you take? What's your next step? Let's discuss that. Mm -hmm.